Through meeting the inside players of the industry, the artistry and the business of making and playing video games has taken on a whole new meaning for me. Now it's time to take a look into the future of games. What's next? Who are the new tastemakers? And where is the audience and industry headed? seat at the biggest competitive gaming tournament in the world has been a thrilling ride. Watching the teams that progressed through the League Championship Series from LA to New York and those that didn't was an emotional roller coaster. I have decided to continue my journey from LCS to Worlds and now I am here in London and I am so excited for what's about to unfold. Let's go check it out. And will earn themselves a shot at the Summoner's Cup in Berlin. We are the lights to ignite the dark and skies. I'm learning that magic and game development really aren't that different. Each involves a creator and a willing audience. After looking behind the curtain at Gearbox Software to see what really goes into modern game design, I'm excited to learn more about some of the industry's top creators and peer into the future of virtual reality. Video games are a cultural experience. It all has to do with not so much the technology, but how the games are experienced and remembered by the people who are playing them. Is there evidence to support that violent thought patterns translate into violent behavior? We're not able to find evidence that that type of associative thoughts are predictive of future behavior. You're saying the verdict's out. As an actor in a game, when I get deeper into the character, it becomes more natural and more real. And it shows, and you believe it as you're playing the game. Virtual reality, giving the consumers things they didn't even know they wanted at the time. Palmer Lucky, the inventor of the virtual reality headset known as the Oculus, and who at 23 is one of the youngest self-made millionaires in the world. There's the beginning of video games, and here's the uh, future standing right here. How you got the idea for Oculus, because everybody has that idea. Everybody wanted to do I mean, virtual reality. Right? It's not a new idea. It's been around in science fiction for decades. Virtual reality, or VR, can be traced back to the early 1800s to panoramic paintings or 360-degree murals. In 1838, stereoscopic photos were discovered where two side-by-side -side photos placed into a viewer created the illusion of 3D space. In the late 1920s, the first motorized flight simulator was created to train pilots and mimic turbulence. 1939 saw the invention of the Viewmaster, a virtual tourism toy which is the basis for all modern virtual reality headsets. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, inventions such as the Sensorama and the Sword of Damocles made important steps toward the evolution of VR. But it wasn't until 1987 when Visual Programming Lab's iPhone, sorry Apple, was created. The first head-mounted display utilizing video that the phrase virtual reality was popularized. The 1990s saw several novel attempts to bring VR to the masses, but the concept didn't catch on due to cumbersome hardware, hefty price tags, and a less than immersive experience. The public mostly forgot about VR until two decades later when Palmer Lucky, a teenager from Long Beach, California, set out to make the first low-cost, high-performance system using a single LCD screen that could deliver HD, next-generation VR. After a massively successful Kickstarter campaign and nine prototype versions, the groundbreaking Oculus Rift has taken the gaming entertainment media by storm. 
introducing the world to the modern era of virtual reality. What made you think you could do it? I, when I started experimenting with it, it was more just like something to play around with, something to see what I could do. So I wasn't doing this because it was a good business bet. I was mm -hmm. doing it because it was something I was interested in doing. When you first did the uh, Kickstarter, you actually built the things yourself? Right. I mean, I had actually been building things by myself at that point for a few years. I started working on VR in 2009. It wasn't until mid-2012 that I actually tried to make this thing happen. What are the uh, major apps that you're using on the, what, is, what are the best games on the... Uh... There's a lot of different things out there. We're working with a lot of publishers like Crytek and Square and uh, CCP and Insomniac. What, what kinds of things do you have that are only, only playable? I think that there's a difference between only playable in VR and best played in VR. For example, simulators, whether they're racing simulators, flight simulators, or you know, space combat simulators. And what uses are they using besides games on them? Yeah, there's people using it for architectural walkthroughs of buildings that haven't been built yet. There's other people using it for medical training. Uh, for watching straight narrative stuff, uh, is, there, is there any real advantage to this? VR is not necessarily the best way to tell every type of stories. Traditional films are gonna be around for a long time. It's its own distinct art form. Just, I would say it's also not just the ability to look around. It's not just taking a frame and then expanding it outwards. It's being able to see things at the correct size and scale. The goal in virtual reality is to represent the virtual camera as exactly as your eyes would be in the real world. If I'm looking at you in a virtual reality environment, you should be exactly the same size and scale you would be in real life. This is the first time I've understood. And the same thing for sets for movies. Those are designed to be able to shoot them. Right. And the same way for VR. There's going to be sets that d designed for VR is going to be very different from designing for television, designing for movies, or designing for plays. The cool thing about VR, in my mind, though, is that it can emulate all those other styles. You imagine like watching Gravity, where you're watching the film, but at certain points you're actually out in space. Mm -hmm. That I'm not necessarily saying that's the best use of it, but it's something you can imagine where you're able to combine the best of old and new storytelling technology. Oculus Rift comes out, and then what's the next generation? What are the improvements? Well, smaller, it's, it's smaller, faster, higher resolution, wider field of view, uh, more ergonomic, all of the standard improvements. The cool thing about VR is that we kind of know what we need to do now. There's nothing we don't know how to do, it's just a matter of time and execution. The gamer, they're locked into another world that isn't their world. I understand how you can lose yourself in whatever consciousness that is. I also am able to sit in front of a television set and lose myself in the movie. There are philosophies that say we're all looking at unreality anyway. And that's what I think gaming is going to come to. I am now going to play Project Morpheus. There shouldn't be cards on this one! <laughs> I'm trying to lose! puts himself in a not so good position. Lust Boy is where he does not want to be right now, and they are now inside Team Solo mid base, looking to put the final nail in the coffin here. Double kill coming in for NL, looking for a triple kill. That's a triple. That's going to be the quadra. He gets a penta kill. They have the front end damage to burst down and kill CLG all the way. Cloud9, why did you bother? There is no damage, there is no base left, there is only victory for AHQ! Watching CLG, Cloud9, and Team Solomon make it all the way to Worlds only to get knocked out in the first round was disappointing. But the energy of the European teams taking on the reigning Korean champions kept the excitement level high. So as Origin just splitting KT open. And look at that gold card onto Pickaboo. He's already used the Unbreakable Will. Nightmare's gone in, forced back out with that Chrono Break. Much like traditional sports, in the world of eSports, there are many organizations that represent a wide range of games. Each game has an array of teams competing within that game, 
and each team consists of that game's best players. From first-person shooters to fighting games to battle arenas, every game in every game genre conducts their championships a bit differently. But no one does it quite as big or bold as League of Legends, whose year-long competition culminates with their World Championship, or Worlds. Let's break it down. 16 teams advance to Worlds by being the best team in their league. Once the Worlds lineup is set, those teams are randomly placed into groups of four. This is the group stage. The two teams with the best record in each group advance to the knockout stage. This is a single elimination, best of five tournament to decide who advances. The final stages of Worlds consist of quarterfinals, semifinals, and the grand finale, where each team competes in best of five matches to determine who is the world champion. How much of what we would have thought coming into week one of group stage was true by the end of week one? Yeah. There's so much change, yeah. right? I expected Cloud9 to not win a single game. Yeah, and they won three. I think North America having a good start, but maybe not getting through right at the end was a surprise to some people, but I think that the teams that were supposed to go through went through. Completely, yeah. In North America, uh, the teams that ended up qualifying, quite surprisingly, was Council Logic Gaming, Team Solo mid second, and then Cloud9 third. And none of them are here. And none of them are here. What they the all got knocked out. It's four on three, but CLG are low. That is good. Bray getting excited for the double kill. What a route. I mean, one of the shortest games that we have had at this World Championship. Incredibly one-sided match. The big surprise to me is how well Europe is doing because they know how to play as a team, and that's what separates the great teams from just great players. Biggest surprises of teams that did or didn't make it to the group stage. Yeah, I guess the biggest surprise for everyone was the fact that Chinese teams didn't perform that well. As people expected, everyone was like, China's super good now, they brought some Koreans, so they're gonna win everything and yeah. be the best, and then they didn't even make it out of groups. That is more games lost in groups this year than it lost at the entire World Championship last year. LGD, another upset! Do you think it was because of the patch? I think it's maybe like people say the communication, which mm. I think it can be true. I think they are not capable of adapting in the game. That's the, the problem I see from them, and it's weird that they didn't perform as everyone expected. Yeah. But, I mean, good for you, right? Yeah, I mean, better for me. We, we perform good, so... <laughs> yeah, you guys have been killing it. Expect it's okay. Big goal. Shot in way. Oh, that shot. Oh, that's a wonderful goal! Oh, oh, in the wild ground. It keeps him alive. Pex Peke gets a solo kill. Oh, 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 oh. And Origin beat LGD! If we were to talk about some of the surprises, the group stages that happened in Paris saw two of three Chinese teams knocked out of the tournament. That has never happened. Yeah. A Chinese League of Legends team has never been eliminated at the group stage until this year. It's not even a question of whether they're a real sport. I think it's a question of what do esports have to offer that traditional sports don't. And I think part of that is the evolutionary nature of games. I think a lot of the things that people have problems with when they start dealing with esports is that you know, you're not out on a football field with your buddies playing games, you're sitting at a computer. But playing games at this level requires in-depth knowledge of both how the systems work, how you can interact with the systems, how you can kind of exploit those to your advantage. And that takes real skill that people might not realize. This is Kevin Lin, COO of Twitch, a company that started a very unique online network for streaming and is now the premier broadcaster of gaming media. Oh, I gotta kill though. Your boy gotta kill. Let us win this game with ease and let me know. Oh, oh no. Why do I play a game that makes me so mad? But Get back in the <laughs> <laughs> Now, Kevin, Twitch, this is the most interesting thing to me because when I was a kid, we watched baseball or football or basketball. Uh, I've noticed the, these kids watch people playing games via your platform. I've never seen anything like it. I think it's revolutionary. It all started, uh, we were originally just in TV, uh, a platform for global distribution of live video. We really wanted to create an, an interesting, differentiated video experience. In the early days of internet video, the only option was to wait for the video to download, which could take a long time or result in poor video quality. As internet speeds increased and computer hardware evolved, the option to watch or stream a video live from a website became possible. And not surprisingly, the music and sports industries were the earliest adopters. As network speeds increased and the infrastructure of the internet was commercialized, companies like Twitch, 
and recently YouTube, entered the market to support a new genre of streaming where users playing video games can broadcast or stream their channel of real-time gameplay to their very own unique and varied audiences. The big fear, I think, when people started gaming a lot was, oh, that's going to take these kids and isolate these people. And, and because of you, no, they're actually social with people around the world. Gaming lately in, in, in the multiplayer world, in the online gaming world, has been increasingly social, right? You make real friends, real connections right. online. And, and sometimes at events like E3 or PAX, you'll get together and actually meet your friends that you've met online. I, I, I have to say, too, again, I've seen young gentlemen here that love this thing and they have something in common, and we need to have something in common yeah. for the world to keep going. Well, exactly. I mean, gaming is a shared experience, and Twitch and, and uh, social video in general has really expanded on that concept, whether you're observing someone who's really talented at the game and appreciating their skill level, or someone who's just funny and entertaining and building a show. How important is it for you to have stars? Like, in the movie business, they go, okay, with this guy, we'll build around this guy. In content creation in general, you want to have that aspirational goal. You want to be a star. You want to be able to, to make a living off of what you do, what you right. love. And there are people making a living playing game, Absolutely. Game, gaming. Yes. Absolutely. We've got thousands of people that make well over minimum wage just streaming and playing the game, playing their games and creating their own shows. There's plenty of people who make tons of money. They're making money from advertising, from subscriptions, from donations, from sponsorships and endorsements. It's, it's, it's a real true economy built on top of our platform. Hey, but it's a new economy. Like, you guys have been around for how many years? Uh, Twitch has been around for four years. So you guys have moved very fast. Yeah, well, the great thing about Twitch, I think, and, and platforms like this and what the internet really unlocks is the ability to create a great platform and let the community figure out what to do with it. Thank yeah. you, buddy. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate you. But what are you watching? How's the going, bros? My name is... Here we go. Oh, people are shooting at me, bro. What's a PewDiePie do? Google him. He's this guy from Sweden who has over 30 million YouTube subscribers. It just seems so lame. He plays video games and makes millions of dollars and it's lame how? Hey, bros, what's going on? This is Cotton Be sure to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Because subscribing makes you feel good. <laughs>Cliff Blazinski, the lead designer of the mega franchise Gears of War. Why don't you walk us through from when you get the original idea before you even get Chainsaw Gun, and then right up until that gets played in someone else's home. One of the life lessons that I have is that every game is unique. But from the way that I generally work is, you know, I have an initial core of what I want to see, and then I work outward as far as an intellectual property that supports that. And then I, I kind of come up with the pitch, which is usually like the one-pager. And basically, you know, if you can't pitch your game in like a tweet, you know, you're maybe overthinking it a little bit. And then you get concept art done up, you know, is this what you're thinking for this character? Is this what you're thinking for this weapon? At the same time, people are doing what we call gray box prototyping. Get a version of a gun in or a version of a move or something. And then once that works, and every day we're in the test lab playing the game. In this day and age, the best way, in my opinion, to release a game is to have early access so people can see if your stuff's broken or, or if, even if it's fun. Instead of what's happened in the last couple of years, is a lot of games come out, sell 10 million copies day one, the servers can't keep up. Do a slow burn, slow release, and hopefully have a game that goes on for years now. How'd you get into this racket? Oh, jeez. I was a lifelong video gamer. I wanted to make games since I was a child, since the first time I saw Space Invaders on a TV. The fact that you could manipulate an image on a TV just blew my mind. I had an IBM PC, made a game when I was 17, 18 years old, which was called Jazz Jackrabbit, that basically made me enough money to eventually drop out of college and do this full time. It was a side-scrolling platform game like Sonic the Hedgehog. Right. And it was on the PC, and the PC didn't have any games like that at the time. It was all the rage on the, the Super Nintendo and the Genesis. Like, hey, here's a corner of the market. We put out a demo for it, and the money started rolling in, and uh, basically just hadn't looked back. And the guy I made that game with, I reunited with 20 plus years later to do my new studio. You were 17, you knew you could earn your living in video games? Yeah, I mean, this is I also, I mean, not to brag, but back then, they didn't have these um, amazing schools they have now that actually teach you the necessary skills. I just had to open up, crack a book and figure it out. Tell me about Unreal Engine. So Unreal Engine is my former employer's mm -hmm. technology. Uh, licensed and empowers many, many games throughout the business. 
which we're currently using on my new game. It's kind of like a prefabricated setup that allows you to build a game and get past all the BS of getting the pixels on screen and the polygons rendered. The Unreal Engine was a major milestone in the history of game design. A game engine is just that, a tool that game designers can use to drive their ideas. It allows them to focus on story, artwork, and creativity rather than how their game will technically work. These days, it's common for a game development team to have several times as many artists as actual programmers. Before the creation of game engines, all games were written as single entities. An Atari 2600 game, for example, had to be built completely from scratch. Almost none of the code used in one game could be used in another. It was necessary for each game company to build every game from the ground up. In the mid-1990s, the rise of the first-person shooter gave birth to the concept of game engines, with the popularity of titles like Doom and Quake leading many aspiring developers to seek out the creator of these games, id Software, who began licensing out the core code of their games, allowing other designers to build upon what they already created. So you worked on uh, Unreal Engine. Yep. And, uh, what did you do after that? I worked on it. The game I'm most well known for for this current generation is a series called Gears of War, Gears of War. Uh, which was pretty successful. It had, uh, spawned a trilogy. Hey, are you the Marcus Phoenix? The one who fought at Asheville Fields? Yep. Wow, cool. Not really. And how, how big is your company now? Uh, we're about 45 people. A lot of these people we're working on these traditional AAA experiences. They're, they're working on Call of Duty 46 or Assassin's Creed 12. And then they came to my studio where I'm always a big believer in creating new original intellectual property, make this new IP and they get to really contribute to it. Everybody at the studio knows, I mean, for the first year, I took a salary of a dollar. I want to work at a studio for me culturally where I know everyone's name. And what is your position there? Uh, I'm the uh, CEO. And one thing about video games is that it's a very collaborative thing. It requires a team to do it, like a sport, right? Mm -hmm. But what I like to say is at the end of the day, you need somebody who's being the coach and making the call or the quarterback throwing the ball. Because uh, you know, when I, st I started the studio, I told people, this is gonna be my baby to start. It's gonna become the company's teenager and then the community's adult. What game are you working on right now? Uh, it's a game called Lawbreakers. Uh, it's set in the near future, and you basically have a unified law versus unified gangs. But it's one of those things where you organize law versus or organized gang, law versus breakers, and they're all breaking the law of gravity. So, oh, I see. People always ask, like, hey, man, why don't you guys do, like, a video game? We would not be against that, but you know, I think most people are smart enough to be like, I could invest a lot of money in Halo or uh, like Call of Duty, Call of Duty, or you know, I could make a Jay and Silent Bob and Suburbia game. You need a League of Legends Jay and Bob though, yes. like that same style. It, that seems to be the the big one. Look at the Dreamer come out. So how does it feel to be a video game celebrity? That's crazy. Going to like meet fans was super weird for me at first because I was like, why, why do I have fans? I, I just play video games. Yeah. Why, why do you like me so much? But you kind of learn that these people do look up to you and you can do a lot of things to make them happy. You meet with your fans, you just talk to them and we want to give back because they're the reason we can do this. Yeah, you have a bit of responsibility, almost like Spider-Man. With great <laughs> power comes great responsibility. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of responsibility or really pressure to perform because there's so many people that I want to really show how good we are. It's not because they're pressuring us, but we pressure ourselves because we yeah. want to do well for them. Of course, of course, you want to make them happy. 
It's been interesting to see our teams and our players evolve. They go from, you know, playing in their pajamas to now a year later being in front of so many fans. And, and it's tough. It's a tough challenge for them. And they guys. have routines. They have like eating like schedules and they have to stay healthy and they're playing like 14 hours a day. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, even a couple years ago, we had a player who actually got scurvy from, <gasps> from just neglecting his personal life. And so we're trying to help teams shape a lot more structure for how they live and how they play. So everything from weight training to social media guidance to PR training because they have hundreds of thousands if not millions of people who look up to these guys as, as their generation's mm. role models. No, definitely. They're their heroes. Yeah. In school. How does an aspiring game player become a professional competitor? It's different for every game, but what all esports games have in common is that aspiring players or teams play their respective games online to prove their abilities to anyone watching. In League of Legends, there is a ranking system that measures the player's skill. If a player can show their talent against the highest level competitors, team scouts then sift through those players to recruit competitors. And if a player has what it takes, they could find themselves with a new career and on the roster of a major esports team. For example, fan favorite Bjergsen began playing at a young age and was noticed and recruited by team solo mid. He is now one of the biggest esports stars in the world. The playing styles have drastically changed from last year to this year. People are pulling out all the stops and I think, I think a lot of people's predictions have been off because they're like, they don't even know what's going on anymore, right? Everybody's predictions have been off. Yeah. And it's also to do with the fact that the format is slightly different for this year's World Championship. Because it of was... the patch, right? Yes, exactly. The patch was an unknown factor. Yeah. And all of these teams came in with like fresh slates. They only yeah. had the practice games. I love it. Yeah. Because it means that once you've seen games happening, your preconceived notions of strengths then need to get tested. And the teams that are able to adjust are the teams that then survive. Which is cool, right? It really, really is. There's no stopping them now. It's time for SKT to make it to the finals undefeated. And the Koo Tigers looking to upset the hometown heroes. Koo will get themselves the ace. Will get them Hey, I'm here with Man vs. Game. I'm not even going to tell you his real name. You know what's interesting? I'm learning so much today. This guy is so well known uh, as a broadcaster. He's like the Al Michaels to us older guys. Uh, <laughs> how did you get into this and become this? I honestly got into this because I was, you know, a college graduate, and uh, but I just was working dead end jobs. So I just had this idea, this brilliant idea. It's going to be like a serial, and I'll try to beat games. You know, like man versus game. That's right. you know, you got to conquer the games. Right. Um, and then I thought somehow. You know, I'll make money doing that. That was my business model. Right. I was like, somehow money will come to Find me. Find something you love and then figure out a way to get paid to do it. That's yeah. the dream. That's the real dream. Right. Nobody thought, oh, there are going to be people watching people gaming and we need someone to broadcast that. I mean, that yeah. just, it's like creating a whole new idea. With this new tool of streaming enabled by a network infrastructure that allows anyone to essentially create their own TV channel on the internet and fill it with whatever programming they want, a new generation of extremely popular online personalities or streamers has arisen. Their styles, content, and audiences are as diverse as traditional broadcast and cable television, and it's growing by millions each month. But I got in there um, kind of on the ground floor uh, when Twitch, the website I, yes. I stream on, they, yeah, yeah, and it went from there, you know, I just it slowly grew my audience. I've been doing this for like five years now. Right. This is what you do for a living. It, it Absolutely. I yeah. can tell you, I am uh, definitely financially, you know, doing better than I ever have been before. Uh, right. You know, Even after going to college and everything, this is, you know, this is a dream go through. People, it must be weird that people around the world in places you've probably never even been, yeah. know who you are. It really is a worldwide phenomenon. You know, and I, I know I have 
tons of fans in like Ireland, right. uh, you know, even in Japan. I, yeah. I get people from Japan coming into my chat room. So, so it's you surreal. interact with your fans. You. Uh, that's a, an important element to what you do. Absolutely. Let me welcome some people. Dark Chaos Viper, Deep Mist. Video bum. Project Seven says, uh, "Hey man, hey man, I like the stream and good luck, brother. You'll need it." The Nook, all of y'all. Until tomorrow, guys. You stay classy, mankind. The the live element of the broadcast is, I feel that, that I feel that that's the strongest uh, right. feature of it is, uh, as opposed to like you know uploading videos. Right. Um, I can have like a, a running conversation with my audience. That's a big deal. It really is. Like maybe that's like why it's gone so well I, right. I, I truly I love gaming uh, and I love really uh, it being on the internet too is very important for me because right. uh, you know I can basically talk about whatever I want right the fact that you've done a new genre a new thing I you know I agree and it's it is crazy it's surreal being a part of like a new just sort of like medium not only a big part but a face of it and a, and a voice of it it must be interesting for your family. Yeah, and they, you know, I have like some uncles that are just like, Ugh. yeah, of course. Yeah. I can't believe people yeah, yeah. pay you for this. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you get a real job. Yeah. So I, I get that from my family. Right. And of course, there's people out there in the world who still, you know, talk about getting a real job. Right. But uh, you know, to those people, I say, you know, I work very hard at what I yeah. do. This is Patrice Desolet who was heavily involved in the wildly successful Assassin's Creed series. Did you have the idea for Assassin's Creed? Yes, that's my baby. What was the idea? Well, at first they asked me to do the uh, Prince of Persia Next Generation, and I've, I've been a bad employee, I guess, because instead of giving them just the Prince of Persia, I gave them Assassin's Creed. And you really brought history into the video game a bit, right? Well, I was not the first one, but uh, I think uh, Assassin's Creed is the one that made history a real subject for video games, yes. Learning from a game is no new thing. For example, in the classic era of games, titles like Oregon Trail, Math Blaster, and many PC-based programs offer the first generation of edutainment. Their primary goal was to teach. Where modern games differ is their focus on entertainment, immersion, and socializing the players. This approach has proven much more effective in imparting knowledge to the player because the lesson is hidden in the entertainment. According to a study by Indiana University, modern students spend almost as much time playing video games as they do in school. With gaming being so woven into the culture, it seems that teachers at schools are catching on. 70% of gamers play with their friends, and only 20% play alone. These pro-social behaviors are critical for learning and social development, and interactive experiences always get players more excited about the material while supporting long-term retention. But the, the one I'm doing right now called Ancestors, the Humankind Odyssey, this time I want to be as scientific as, as uh, you can be in a talk, video game. Talk about that one. It's all about going through the day when something special happened and we were not the same afterwards. So the very first day, someone stood up. So this, is the, the uh, this is the video game version of On the Origin of the Species? Probably. Let's tell about our story. Why are we here? And we're all like fighting each other, trying to survive. <laughs> we survived by being friends with each other. Not One of the ways that um, violence has gone down so in the past 100 years, especially the past 20 years. You know, Steven Pinker will tell you, it's, um, it's empathy, being able to put yourself in another person's position. And the strange thing is, the people who wrote the big anti-war novels of the 20th century, they thought by doing literature, they were um, changing the world. It turns out they were. Yeah. They actually did. When you start having games that are immersive, and you start feeling that, it seems like if literature can do this, video games can do this. I think you might be doing a really great thing. Oh, it was great talking to you, man. Thank you, sir.
was anyone's game in London, but after the events in Brussels with the final European team being eliminated, the Korean teams are now center stage, headed to Mercedes-Benz Arena in Berlin. The Super Bowl of eSports. This is SKT1. SKT are looking towards the Nexus, and SK Telecom will hold true and finish the game. Up to this point in Season 5, they remain undefeated, charging through each unfortunate team matched against them with fierce domination. That's going to be Wolf going down. First blood to the two Tigers. SK running down the lane. Hojin can't even help on the outside right now. Somehow, Koo gets out, only losing prey. No, there goes Hojin. Now goes down Gorilla. And it looks like it's going to be an ace in the base. 22 to 13. When SKT takes over, they start to steamroll. Just like that, it's over. That's a double. Baker gets hit by the arrow. That's going to be a kill for Prey as well. Is there a triple coming in here? No, it's a double double. Curl gets the shot necessary. A double kill for the Cassidy. And this spells very bad things for SKT. Koo Tigers are falling. SKT will be your first ever two time world champions. Watching each stage of Season 5 Worlds and meeting the teams and the players has been thrilling, and it comes as no surprise that the powerhouse team, SKT1, has emerged to once again claim the coveted trophy and become the only league team to have the title World Champions twice. Diving into the world of competitive gaming and esports has been truly amazing. I didn't know what to expect when I started down this road, but after meeting the players, talking to the coaches, and attending packed stadiums of fans, I'm now a true believer. Esports is definitely the future, and I'm pumped to see how it evolves. So in the future, where do you see this headed? Like, do you see you guys having stadiums in different places and, you know, home teams? People always ask us, like, where do you see esports going in the next couple of years? And I'm like, I don't even know where it's going next year. Yeah. And so we're, uh, we're taking it all in stride. And so kind of who knows, but uh, we're kind of all in on this. Yeah, of course. It would be really cool if you started seeing, like, little leagues pop up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was pretty surprising to us when we saw colleges that now have scholarship programs around League of Legends. Everything from kind of visas being legitimized by the U.S. government to countries like Taiwan making military exemptions for not only Olympic athletes but now League of Legends athletes. I mean, all of this stuff is happening so fast for us and there may one day be the peewee football analogy yeah. for League of Legends one day and so from there it kind of remains to be seen. Yeah. Where do you guys see esports heading? Next five, ten years, you think it's still going to be going just as strong as it is today? Way stronger. Stronger. Yeah. We get higher viewership than the Baseball World Series. We, we, we sold out the Madison Square Garden in a shorter amount of time than any event has ever been sold out at Madison Square Garden. No way. Yep. Justin see... Bieber? Yep. <laughs> I think it was 48 seconds on the first group what? of tickets. Oh my gosh. What started off as a very niche community is now becoming more and more mainstream. Dang, that's cool. Obviously, eSports is on its way up. Do you have any predictions for where it's headed? I think eSports will keep getting bigger and bigger because like a few years ago nobody really knew about esports now you can even like bet on League of Legends like you yeah. can bet who's gonna win and that just shows that it's getting bigger and bigger also we're playing on bigger and bigger stages so like that's coming more money into the game I don't know how long League of Legends is gonna last but I'm sure that other games will also step up later on yeah no definitely when I first started on this esports journey I had no idea how big it was. The energy alone is so electric. Going to somewhere like LCS in LA or um, Madison Square Garden, like that blew my mind that it's that kind of audience, like an arena type audience would come and pay money and travel to see these people game. I think that was always the hope that it could potentially be this big, but it's amazing, which is so exciting because we're gonna start seeing all these different games jumping in and saying, hey, we're making a competition out of this. That's exciting.
This is Randy Pitchford, co-founder of Gearbox Software. Recently, he partnered with the National Video Game Museum to ensure this vast collection of gaming treasures has a permanent home for years to come. Hey, Randy Pitchford. Hey, how's it going? Good, uh, if I pronounce your name right, I keep wanting to say Pitchfork because that's a that would be a. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people name. on the internet that do yeah. that, and I'm, I, I'm, I love it. Yeah, I, I can't get enough. I, <laughs> I know uh, Gearbox Software, and you're a CEO, but this is shocking to me. You're putting a, a physical museum with this stuff and times 20 of the history of these games from day one, and you're putting it in Dallas. That's and you're, right. You're yeah. really doing that. Yeah, it's a, it's a suburb of Dallas, Frisco, which is just north oh, of I Dallas, Frisco, know. Texas. And uh, yeah, I met the guys at the Video Game History Museum, and they've had a, a just a traveling exhibit. Yes. They've been collecting the stuff for, for 30 years, right. uh, John, Joe, and Sean. And I met them years ago, and I, I, I talked to them, and I said, this needs to have a permanent right. a permanent place. And it's, uh, it, it's gonna be the first of its kind, the first dedicated physical museum uh, for video games, it's the National is, Video Game Museum. But why is that important uh, in your mind? First of all, it's you know there's there's only been so many mediums over the history of our species. First, right. people were drawn on cave walls. Then they figured out how to write words. Uh, then we started figuring out how to record things. We we could record our voices, record music, uh, record film and video. And all these great innovations have been very important for our cultural development and our intellectual development. Video games are the first time we've been able to interact with our medium. We've been able to give it input, and then it changes what happens. We're particularly participating in the entertainment. We're participating in the medium. Yeah, I remember when Pong came out, I was shocked. Like the difference between not having something like Pong and then Pong coming out and sitting in our living room with our friends. That's like, crazy. It's unbelievable how, how far we've gone. We've, we've started to mature as an industry and, and it's important to preserve it. We're gonna lose our history. We're gonna lose our history unless we preserve it, and it's that time. So to have a permanent facility where, uh, where enthusiasts, people that have nostalgia for the history, people that are curious to see the trends and so they can project what the future might look like, or people that want to study that history, to have a place to go where you can have access to all this history is really And really I think important. it's just wonderful. They can come down to Dallas and, and, and see the history and see something that they are interested in. It's really interesting how different uh, types of people, different age groups uh, react to this stuff. And now people are watching people Play video games like a it's, yeah, it is, it is. yeah. There's, there's, you can, the, the Staples Center right next yes. door. They yes. filled that arena yes. with a game called League of Legends. Yes. And they filled the arena. It was yes. insane. Eighty thousand people live watching people sitting in front of a computer. Like, and, and it's, and, and the skill of the of the professional players. Um, I, I actually, for a brief period of time, I played uh, esports. It's called esports. I played right, yeah, professionally yeah. in the Doom and the Quake era. Oh my gosh! And the, some of the guys that I was playing with that, that dedicated their lives to being professional. Professionals, they're they're killing it. Some yeah. of these guys are, are pulling down seven figures. That's very cool. Thank hey, you, buddy. Cheers, man. I appreciate it. Can't wait to see the place. After taking a walk through the past, present, and future of the games industry, I've come away with a deep appreciation for a medium that I know will continue to shape technology, culture, and art for generations to come. Somehow. Even with my new education in video games, I've got a feeling I've only scratched the surface. And as a father of two, at least I'm up to speed for now. Look up the National Video Game Museum yes. and come to Frisco, che Texas and check it out. It's That's unbelievable. Right. And do you have an Applebee's or anything to eat down there? Some fair my soap is really too strong. Oh yeah, why don't you shut up? You're a great broadcaster. How did you get the confidence to learn to do that? It's basically from watching you. Right. I learned it from watching <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah. They even got like some rings, like <gasps> five rings for the players oh last my God. time. You have to train me. I need okay. this ring. I can try my best. I'm really good at Mario Kart, so let's start there. <laughs> okay, Mario Kart it is. <laughs> and we can fake it if you want. Here we are, up, up, down, down, left, right. You gotta play like an actor. Yeah, they're always, they're always holding the wrong controller. Because what's funny is those guys will spend all day using the technology yes. in their jobs, and guess what they do in their downtime? The same? They play video, they well, play video they games. So, hey, anybody ever tell you you look like Jackie Chan's son? <laughs> yes. Dude, I grew up in Louisiana, everybody thought it was oh, like yeah, Jackie yeah. Chan. <laughs>